Excellent. Right. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation and also sticking around for the, the very last talk of the session. And as Pat introduced, um, this paper is what I call undergraduate driven research. So Marisa was a summer intern from the University of New Haven. Cody was a summer intern from the Rochester Institute of Technology. Emily and um, Brittany were interned from SUNY Onyonta. And then Holly is a fuel station staff scientist. And Ed was a part-time graduate assistant who was helping me out with the projects. He had his own thesis projects. So um, again, I was very honored to be invited and also that the paper was uh, highly um, regarded by fellow LNO uh, readers. So uh, that is the paper that we published. And um, to give you some background, it's typically like a short uh, letter or research communication type paper that we go for as undergraduate institution researchers. So that's why I initially approached Pat that I was interested in a short format letter um, article. But then um, we had a discussion during the um, was it a New Mexico meeting, I remember. And uh, she took the time to sit down with me um, during a break. And she suggested that the current evidence might be a good um, vesicle for this research. And um, I really appreciated that advice. Also, a special thanks to Pat and also Rachel, who um, is the managing editor, and including all of the co-authors, student co-authors, in every single communication between the editorial office and the authors. And that was very, very educational for the students to learn what peer review process is all about. And uh, also the anonymous reviewers, three uh, anonymous reviewers, uh, were very, very uh, constructive. Um, and uh, they really took the time to read through the manuscript and uh, gave very uh, important insights, especially the marine side of things, the global accumulation of the plastic particles, and that was relatively new to me, and I really uh, appreciated the depth and breadth of the uh, ASLO members' uh, expertise. So uh, to give you some background, um, so the plastics have been ubiquitously used in the last 50 years. And you might have heard of um, like archaeologists saying that you know, hundreds or thousands of years from now, they would use the presence of plastic in the stratum as a sign of the you know, mid-1900s. And uh, but we are not very uh, good at managing unwanted plastics. So this figure is only for plastic packaging materials made in 2013. Only 14% were collected for recycling, 14% went into incineration and sometimes the energy or the waste to energy stream, but 40% went to landfill and then 32% is what they call leakage into the environment. And this Brown et al. paper in 2011 was one of the uh, earlier papers that connected human activities with the increased amount of microplastics in aquatic environments. So in this data set, most of the sampling sites were um, near the population centers in the coastal areas. And then um, this project came along, which um, my students, undergraduate students in the uh, study abroad class to Ogasawara Islands in Japan, and I uh, contributed three citizen science samples. So ours were those uh, three grab samples from near shore, and that's the uh, overall data set that uh, Abby Barrows and her team of uh, adventure scientists collected. And our samples all came negative for suspended microplastics. 
However, overall, they found that actually uh, the microplastic concentration in the pelagic waters were higher than coastal um, counter, the, uh, counterpart for both the Pacific that we were in and also globally. So um, that's Chichijima, um, one of the Ogasawala Islands that I have been leading the study abroad in the short term uh, study abroad programs to. And that is about 170 miles north of Iwo Jima. So it's really in the middle of the Pacific. And we have great time. Um, and you can see that it looks very pristine. And the beaches look spotless. The water is crystal clear. However, if you look closely, we find all these plastic debris. And looking at the type of bottles and the uh, letters printed on them, the, the degree of fouling, etc., it's clear even to students that they are not from the shore because they have very strict system of all the tourists packing their trash back to the lodge. They do not have any uh, public garbage bins. And those are probably the pictures that you have seen over and over in recent years. Uh, plastic debris of all sizes uh, affecting marine lives and also microplastic particles being ingested by uh, smaller animals. And humans are no exceptions. So this was a pilot study uh, by Austrian researchers um, in the summer. Uh, this past summer, but they analyzed store samples from eight subjects from eight continents, and all of them had microplastics. And they found up to nine types per subject, and then mean was 20 particles per 10 gram of store. So that is actually quite stunning number compared to what you might find in the ambient water, even in a very urban areas. So uh, this is a typical kind of diagram of the, um, an aquatic ecosystem. And people have been studying the microplastics um, that are affecting basically most of the animals. And the plankton, including phytoplankton and zooplankton, that has been relatively um, new part of the microplastics research. Um, and Zooplankters have been studied a lot, but not quite um, primary producers. But as I see it, the um, things that are happening to oops, sorry, larger um, consumers, I see them as more of terminal symptoms of microplastic or plastic pollution in general. And I wondered if there are direct influence of microplastics on primary producers in aquatic systems. So um, we did li literature review of microplastic effects on the aquatic um, primary producers. And the full summary table with full citations are in the paper. But here is a very kind of abbreviated rough um, table. But as you can see that uh, we found a good sort, um, the uh, assortment of results for unicellular microalgae some for colonial and filamentous microalgae, and then some for macroalgae. And at the time, we didn't find anything for the macrophytes. But um, they are limited in scope. However, there were what uh, we felt, felt was very substantial evidence of microplastics doing something to aquatic primary producers. So the first project that um, my undergrad researchers and uh, the other helpers of the research did was to establish the harvest protocols from six personal care products. And that was a time when the microbees were pretty big in the news and the body wash and the face wash, et cetera, uh, that contained those plastic particles. So um, we established a effective method to harvest those particles from the actual uh, products. And then the particles were uh, characterized 
using the flow cam imaging particle analyzer we, that we luckily had at the fuel station that was acquired by the um, NSF FSML grant a few years before my arrival. So what we found was that uh, um, most of those particles are actually not micro bees. They have very rough and irregular shapes and uh, size ranges and uh, uh, size frequency was also variable. And as you can see from the shapes, they also have large surface area. So that was quite eye-opening to uh, both my students and myself. The second was to use some of those uh, harvested microplastics and grow them in um, cyanobacterial cultures. And then again, we analyzed the data under the microscope and also the flow cam. And uh, we found that the growth patterns of microcystis and also, also dolichospermum were affected in terms of the um, number of particles, algal particles, and also the particle size. And um, especially dolichospermum seems to stick to those um, plastic particles more. And then the next project that started after that manuscript was mesocosm experiment. So for this one, we used um, the calibration bees. Those are often used in feeding experiments for zooplankton. Those are perfectly uh, spherical particles. And then the, what we uh, harvested from the coconut scrub product, that was a body wash and then uh, microplastic from one of the body wash products as well. And then uh, the, the mesocosms were incubated in Otsigo Lake, which is where uh, our field station is located at. So um, this is the kind of um, DIY incubation racks that we have been using as uh, part of the network of undergraduate um, mostly undergraduate institution through the Northeast Glion, and uh, they were used for nutrient limitation experiments, but we reused the setup for the microplastic uh, research as well. And you can see they are strung together on rope and they're incubated, and that's Marisa uh, filtering the samples. And that's what uh, 50 micrometer calibration bees look like in Utamo's uh, settling chamber. Because they are perfectly uh, spherical, you get these uh, big halo around them. And then that's what we got from the coconut scrub. However, interestingly, it's marketed as coconut scrub, but in the ingredient list, it says apricot kernel powder. And we couldn't find any powders that are from coconut on the ingredient lists. And that has been a repeated uh, challenge for us that uh, it's hard to find out what those particles are actually made out of. So um, the body wash scrub, again, um, we do not have the analytical uh, equipment. Uh, so our way of determining the possible plastic identity is by density and also um, the using the spoon or something to kind of melt it under the heat. But um, that body wash scrub seems to be polystyrene. And then calibration bees are listed as polystyrene by the uh, manufacturer. So um, this is a rough um, result from the incubation study that uh, in that's control, that's for calibration bees, and that's the coconut or applicant powder, and then the, that's the microplastic from body wash. And um, interestingly, in control and calibration bees and also the plant particle, basically, cryptophyta was a um, good amount of the phytoplankton. However, it totally dropped out in the body wash and replaced by chrysophytes. And I learned quite a bit about mixotrophy and also the possible interaction between the cryptophytes and cyanobacteria. So that's something that I need to think about when I go home. And in conclusion, um, aquatic primary producers do interact with microplastics. And the interaction is really dependent on the taxa of the organism and also the type of microplastic, if it's primary or virgin um, 
microplastics or something that came from the larger, micro, uh, larger plastics that degraded into small pieces or secondary microplastic. Also size, type of the resin, and also the response variable or a gene if the gene expression is the uh, results. So then um, those are the future questions. Um, food aggregates uh, with microplastics, uh, bottom-up effects on the food web, and a long-term fate of microplastic, um, fouling and defouling uh, cycles, etc. So um, those are all the um, help that I got for the project. And I'm over time, so I'm going to finish up. Thank you very much. Um, I chose those because those are usually involved in harmful algal bloom formation in freshwater systems in trop uh, the temperate waters. Yeah. Thank you.